Okay, so we're going to start now, and I just want to show you, remind everybody, if you're not already aware, that the exam is tomorrow night, and uh, the conflict's at 4.30. And if you want to be sure to click on this exam schedule so you make sure you know, uh, well, you know you're in Follinger, but if you're taking the conflict, it's not in the same location as last time. It's no longer in 66 Library. It's on 100 Greg. So I'll send you a reminder. Now, um, what we're going to do today is just go, we're just going to have a review today. And so we're just going to go over the um, practice exam and the study guide. And it's, it's really uh, that, the practice exam, the study guide, and the homework. If you know all that, you'll be great for the exam. You'll be very prepared. So um, I thought we'd do the practice exam because the real exam tomorrow night is about the same length and covers really similar things. And when it doesn't, when it's something new, I'll bring it in. But I just want to um, make sure that you understand how to do all the problems here. And of course, we can refer to the study guide problems that are similar. So. Uh, this isn't your, your exam's going to look like this, but obviously it's not. So I just want to, um, I don't want to spend too much time on the beginning, but I certainly want to like uh, make sure, like if you have any questions on any of this, uh, we can look at the, to refer in, in case you don't have the key in front of you, I can look at that. Maybe that would be better to remind you of what the answers are and what you might have had problems with. You've already looked at this. So I hope, and if you haven't, um, it will still be helpful. But the idea, I think, does, no, does anybody, I don't think I need to go over this one, right? Okay. Now, um, this is uh, the rules of correlation. So it says here, x and y are two lists of numbers with correlation 0.3. If all the y values are multiplied by negative 2, it will be multiplying by a constant, multiplying by, multiplying all the x's or all the y's by the same value does not change r. But what does change it is this negative. So that changes the sign. So that's what you should be alerted to here. So adding a constant or multiplying all, all the values, as long as you do it to all of them, either all the x's or all the y's, okay? And the way you can remember that is when you think of correlation as an association between two variables, like height and weight. The association between height and weight is not going to change if you go into the metric unit, units instead of uh, in, if you change from inches to uh, meters or, you know, pounds to kilograms. It's not going to change the relationship. Okay, does that, that, that will help you remember it. So what will change it is just changing some of the values or multiplying by negative. And of course, if you multiply by negative again, it goes back to where you started from. Okay, <coughs> these are all sort of conceptual problems. And there were, <coughs> excuse me. All right. So the regression and the standard deviation line are the same when. Maybe it's best to look at a picture of a regression line, like on the next page. So the regression line's always flatter, and here's the SD line. That's on the next page. So they'd be the same when the regression line is just like the SD line. Otherwise, it has a flatter slope. The flattest slope it can have is when it's they always cross at the point of averages. And if the regret, the next question, we'll, we'll do the two together. The next says the re regression line is a horizontal line through the average of y when? When r is equal to 0. So if we drew it in here, it would look like a horizontal line right through there. And that's when r is equal to 0, and this is when r is equal to 1. So when the regression line is equal to 1, the r is equal to 1, they're the same line. And when the regression line is equal to 0, it goes right through the average 
of the y's, 80. The idea is, you can see the picture probably more clearly here, r equals 0 just means that, you know, whatever x is tells you nothing about y, so the best prediction is the average of y. Now, removing outliers always causes the correlation to go down, up, or it could cause either way, and the best picture of that is on page 105 in your notes where it, it shows it pretty clearly. And I'll just show it to you briefly just so you remember. Here you had a very, this is on page 105, you probably can't see it, but you had a bunch of dots like this that have a very strong correlation, and this one lowers the correlation. So if we removed it, the points would hug a line and we'd get a much stronger correlation. Now this one started out with a very low correlation, and the only correlation, it looks like r is equal to zero, but you have this outlier way out here that gives it this correlation. So if you remove it, it if the outlier raises r and removing it would lower it. So just think of a picture, okay? Just think of the picture and see what you think. It's, it, there'd be pretty obvious cases. Sometimes it's difficult to tell. All right, now these ecological correlations are correlations based on averages. Boy, did I draw, I have to redo this. It looks terrible. But anyway, what you're doing is you're um, condensing. Like here's individual, edu this is just um, people's individual education and individual income of a bunch of dots here, right? And I'm saying, okay, everybody from s the state average, these four people are from s this state, one, and then when you take the, when you average, you remove the within group scatter, and you're just left with the between group scatter. Now that we know uh, analysis of variance, variance, that makes a lot more sense to you. So when you reduce that within group scatter and just leave the between group, you get a stronger correlation. Not always, but usually. Does that make sense? All right. Now let's just move on to, um, just because I didn't have one on ecological correlations here. Okay, let's move on. So now on this next page, um, this is an important page, so you should know things on it. So I highlighted what I think is really important for you to know here, so that uh, you really should know. The two lines, you have to know which is the regression and which is the SD, all right? For sure know, well, this is good too. If, if you're on both lines, that's the point of averages. And of course, you should understand um, which students did better on exam two than predicted. You have to think the prediction line is this line. So the students that did better have to be above that line. Like this student is in between these two lines. This, this student did worse because this is the regression line, okay? If that student was up here in between the two lines, he'd be better. So just, these are our predictions. Our positive residuals are above it, negatives are below it. Um, okay, this is, I highlighted it because I think it's really important. You need to know this. This is um, understanding that if a student, okay, how to basically change from a z-score in x to a z-score in y. It's just you multiply by r. So if a student, when it says one standard deviation below average, that means its z-score is negative 1. Then you multiply by r to get the prediction for the y variable. Okay? So that's very easy. Now what if you're given a value and on exam 1 and one do an estimate. We call this the three-step process because you take the value, you change it to a z-score by subtracting off its average. Where are we? And this is in exam one. We're subtracting off 98, we're subtracting off its average and dividing by its standard deviation. And then we see that it's a z-score of one multiplied by r that gives us the z-score for the second variable. And how do you get that? The second variable was 0 0.5. The easiest way for me to get that is to think, okay, zero, po I know a lot of you just like to solve the equation, but for me it's easier just to say, okay, where am I? I'm on exam two. So I'm 0.5 standard deviations above average. So I'm just going to start at the average, 
and say plus a half a standard deviation. So it's, the answer is 86. You just have to start at the average, and then this, what uh, the z-score tells you is how many standard deviations you are above average or below average, if it's negative. Questions on that? All right. So then this is, uh, what is the slope? All right, that's very important. That was a formula you need to know. And that's just R times SDY over SDX. And SD is always what you're predicting. So that is SDY. You're always predicting Y. So that's what it looks like. And so it's these statistics here. 0.5. Oh, they're the same. It's an easy exam. So even if you got it mixed up there, it wouldn't matter. Okay, and then um, the y-intercept, that's not as important as knowing the slope. I might not ask it, I might. Um, but if, you, if I do, what do you do? You plug in the point of averages. You have the slope here. You have exam 2 equals 0.5 times exam 1, and you just, you can plug in any point on the line, and this is one we know. Any other questions on this so far? So what is the standard deviation of the prediction errors? Um, or the root mean square error? This the square root of 1 and minus r square comes up so much, so it should look very familiar to you now. Times, let's get over here. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here. It's that. And that's given to you. You don't even have to memorize it. Let's look at our formula sheet on what's given to you and what isn't. And that one is the one given to you. So you don't really need to worry about that. This is you need to know. Okay. So let's move on. And you feel free to interrupt me whenever you um, have a question. All right, let's look at this one. This looks like a very, um, this is when we're starting to get into inference. But it starts, says, how do the number of hours students study predict, how well do they correlate with what the score you'd get? You'd think it would be po a positive correlation, and it is. Now, is this, um, this is a random sample of 64 out of a population of 3,000. And that 3,000 number never comes up. That's you don't have to worry about that. That's just a larger population. Um, and so here we have the summary. And again, um, here I'm asking you to remember that formula for a slope again. So you're predicting y. Don't always think x is on top. I just, I really don't pay any attention when I do these tables. So here y happened to be on top. And I remember some students saying, why did you do that? And honestly, apparently I'd been putting x on top a lot, but I didn't even realize that. You know, I just make these charts sometimes without really thinking about that. I thought, I, that's why I always say, why is what you're predicting? So here, some people got thrown off by that. All right, so the slope is just 0.4 times y over x, and there we got 2.4. All right, so, um, so now we know the slope right here, 2.4. And I want to, you have to, the standard error for the slope is a little bit complicated, and that's another one that I gave you, that you're going to get. So if you, if you don't have to calculate that. So here it is. You could do it either way. They're equivalent, OK? So you get that, whatever it is. And there it is. Now, right away, if I asked you to do a z-test, because you know to see if this slope of 0.4, remember what we're doing here. I should draw the model. We have. Just so you understand, we have this population that has all 3,000 students in here. And the null is that in the population, how much you study and what score you get is 0. r equals 0. It's the same as the slope. Beta 1 equals 0. It's the same thing. That we're, there's no model. So what's the idea? The idea is that we randomly, we didn't have information on <coughs> all 3,000, so we randomly drew out of here 
64 and got information about them and we say, wow, we took 64 points out of here and we do in our sample regression, we do have this slope with scatter around it. And that's this, that's it. We have a slope of what? Two point, so our sample, which is B1, is equal to 2.4, but our model, the null model, is that this is our null model, is this. So how likely is it, if it really was this, to get that big a difference? And that's what our test statistics are telling us. Now since we just have one slope, I'm giving you all these different ways to do it, but that's just because I'm looking ahead. You could just do it by this. You say the observed minus the expected, which is zero, over the standard error for the slope. So we have that information already, and that's going to be the exact same thing as doing this. And you can see it on the front page, if you, if you can see it right here, that it's the exact same thing. Because um, if you use, if you do it the other, if you say, okay, um, z equals the observed slope minus the expected, which is zero, over the standard error for the slope, then what are you doing? The observed slope is r times sdy over sdx. The standard error for the slope is right here. It has that same sdy over sdx, so they're going to cancel out. And what you get is the square root of 1 minus r squared over the square root of n. And when you uh, mul simplify, it's just exactly r over the square root of 1 minus r squared times n, which is that. And then if you square it, you get the chi-squared, that. So these two are the si you know, the z squared is the chi squared when you have one degree of freedom. This is for, you can only do that when you have p equals 2. p equals 2. One degree of freedom. Okay, one slope. Let's, so I, so this isn't, I don't want it to be all mysterious. If you, if you, what, why am I talking about this? Well, because it's interesting and it's important, but I'm talking about it to help you on the exam. If I give you the slope, or if you get the slope, and the standard error for the slope, there's no reason why you can't do that. That's just easy. And same with t. Y you just do this. t would be what? The observed slope minus your expected slope over the standard error plus for the slope. That's the only difference. And that's what we're doing here. Okay, so we have all these statistics. So let's look for uh, this, the confidence interval. So you definitely need to know this. The confidence interval is just, what is that? So you get this slope, right? But every time you get do this, it's a random sample, you're going to get a different number, right? You're gonna, this, is, this is not going to be exact. You want to put error bars around it. So we say there's some true population slope out there, and we think it's, if we're doing a significance test, we think it's zero, and we want to know that, okay, 95% a 92% confidence interval means that 92% of the time, since the distribution of these slopes follows the normal curve, that 92% uh, of the time, you're going to get, you know, this close to the true population, like in that area. So. That's all it means. So if you land outside here, that's going to happen 8% of the time. All right, so what, what is that critical value? It's just the critical value corresponding to 92% on the curve. You would find it by going to the normal curve. Does anybody want to know this? How to get that 1.75 here for the 92%? Do you need to know it? It's just the course, it's just the z-scores that have 92, that you'll find on the table with 92% in the middle. All right, now here's your statistics for, uh, you know, the four statistics. And uh, the easiest thing to do, I g uh, the way you distinguish them is what? Um, they're based on this formula 
I think the easiest one to remember is just this one. Chi squared is equal to r squared over 1 minus r squared times n. And you'll be able to spot that one right away. It has no degrees of freedom or anything, so n would just be the 64. See the 62s. Anything with the, now they have to be either f or t. So um, that's, this part is the same. f is this part, r squared over 1 minus r squared is the same. So they're all going to have, look like that, that or the square root. But then n has, is not, has is tweaked by something. It's not, so it's n minus the number of parameters over the number of parameters minus 1. But when the parameter is 2, you don't even see that part because 2 minus 1 is 1. And it's just n minus 2. So any questions on that? People ask me, when do you know whether it's n minus 2 or n minus p? It's always n minus p. It's just p changes depending on your model. The degrees of freedom, these degrees of freedom refer to errors around your model. So if your model has p parameters, it's just the scatter around those parameters. Okay? Now, if we change to a one-sided, one side is just half of a two-sided, the p-value. So now, um, let's look at this. Um, so you have one, two, three, four, five parameters. So remember that the chi-square, the mean of the chi-square is going to be about five if you have uh, its, its degrees of freedom. So that's what, the, that's what that one's going to look like. And the mean of the f is always one. It's always one because we've divided through by p minus one to make it that way. Okay? So. Now, do you want, um, I don't want to intimidate you so you don't uh, ask questions. I'm not sure, show of hands, how many people have done this already, this exam? So, okay, because I'm going through it kind of as if you have done it. I'm going to do it right now as if you, well, I don't know how I'm going through it. <laughs> and I don't want to say exactly how to do this problem because you're going to see something slightly different. So I'm trying to give you a little bit broader perspective. But here's one where you probably just need to know the method. So let's look at this. So what it, what's, what's happening here? The scatter plots show the survey responses of 100 females and 140 males to two questions. How many people have you slept with in your life? And what percent of your tuition are your parents paying for? All right. So now what are we doing here? Translate the male and female regression equations above into an equivalent multiple regression equation. So this is the same x for both of them. This is the sex partners, right? And this is, this is split. So all we want to do is include a gender variable. But we also have to include an interaction term because the slopes are so different. This is actually fascinating. If you're a female, it says, the more sex partners you have for each additional sex partner, there's a real loss in how much your parents are paying for your tuition. I'm not saying it's causal, but it's extraordinary data. And this is saying the more sex partners, when I saw this, or just looking at it now, actually, the more sex partners you have, it's saying the more your parents are paying your tuition. Uh, I mean, one interpretation, if it was causal, that jumps out at me is that parents wouldn't like it if their daughters had a lot of sex partners at college and they're going to, or don't want them out of their sight or something. And maybe they say, oh, okay. I really don't know for guys. I don't think that's what's going on, but it, we have very, we have a huge interaction here is what I'm saying. Huge interaction. We, so we have to have a sex partner's time gender. So let's do it. 
So how are we going to do this? The idea is that males are coded as zero. You have to focus on whichever one's coded as zero. We've been keeping pretty consistent with that. So you'll, you know, if I, but whatever's coded as zero, you start with that one. So you look for the male plot, which is this one, and you say, okay, why am I doing that? I'm going. I'm going to immediately. Uh, I'll say these are the only two relevant ones then, because these I can cross out. Because when gender is zero, this all drops out. This whole, when gender is zero, this is all I have. And so I have to match. The, these are the only two that match so far. So I, it's either this one or this one. That's super easy because it matches with that. That's all you have to think about. Now you just have to decide the last, between the last two. So the last two, now what do you have to do? Now you want to change it to this right here. So what do you want to get? You want to get, instead of 79, you want to get 81, okay? For gender, that's what you want to get, 81. But I already have 79, so what I put in right there is going to be 81, put that down because you want 81, minus 79. That's what I want. Is that what I got there? No. Does the other one have plus 2? Yes. That's why it's the other one. But we can go further. 79 minus 2. When gender is 1, this is, not, this is just going to be a number. So you're going to get 77. That doesn't match out. You want 81. And for this one, what do you want? This affects, you want to get, I would just say, okay, I want to get negative 4.4 right there. That's what I want, negative 4.4. 4. But I already have what? I already have 0.4, so I have to subtract that off. And that's where that negative 0.48 comes from. You just want it to add up, that's all. It's not hard, it's just arithmetic. Okay, if you switch the code... Um, if you switch the code, what would change? Well, how could it change if you switch the code here? You have no G here. There's no G, it's, so it doesn't make any difference. There's no, you're switching the code for gender, but there's no gender in here or here. The only thing that could change is where there's a gender, so the multiple regression. All right, any questions on that so far? Now this one. Um, so what are we doing here? We're trying to match a model. This is like, um, this is just data in the table, and we're trying to describe it with a model that accurately, so they match, okay? So uh, these two binary variables, and it says, okay, and they're measuring some quantitative variable here, months. So how do we know what to do? Well, in general, I mean, you just said, what are we doing here? We lined it up like this. We have A here, and A can be either 0 or 1, and B here, and that can be 0 or 1. All right. So, and then we have a model that looks like Y, or whatever you have, equals some intercept, which is right here, plus something times A, plus something times B, plus something times A times B. And it matches up to when these are 0 or 1. So this is, this is when they're both 0. So for example, um, when they're both 0, right here, you want a 4, because there was a 4 in here. I'll just do this one. This says what? 4 10, 6, and 17. Okay, so when they're both 0, that means all this drops out, so we've got to have a 4 there. All right, so now let's look at, um, what's this? B is 0, sorry, and A is 1. B is 0 and A is 1. So when B is 0, that all drops out, right? So you basic, basically you're adding 6 here to get there. Now when you go from here, where are you? B is 1, and A is 0. So you're saying 4 plus what equals 6? So that's plus 2. 
And now finally, if this is a little confusing, I should just write it out. Now to get this one, that's when they're both one. Both of them are one. So, so far we have that. So we say, okay, to get that one, we're just going to say y equals 4 plus 6 plus 2 plus, what more do I have to add to get 17? And so we have 5. And that's this model. That's the idea. Yes? What if you had to figure out the 17? All right. So it would be the same way. You'd have to figure out the 17. If I said there was no a interaction, then you'd write a model like, so you want me to say, okay, I gave you this, and now you have to figure out the 17. Okay. So then you would see y equals 4 plus 6 times a plus 2 times b plus 5 times ab. You'd have that model. And that would even be easier because you'd say, okay, and you didn't have that 17 there. That's gone. But you see how that's in the spot where they're both 1? So you just put a 1 in for here, a 1 in for here, a 1 in for there, and a 1 in for there. Multiply them. Isn't that easier? Yeah. yeah. There might be other combinations of it, but they're not going to be hard. And they're only, you know, everything's just worth one point. It's not going to be very a lot. Okay. Now, let's move on here. And it says, this pertains to the three scatter plots. Okay. For which plot is there an interaction? All you have to look for an interaction is different slopes. This has a slope like this between the two groups. The two group slopes are different, so that's two. Now, the only thing about cause confounders if you're talking about causation. So let's say we're trying to figure out if x causes y. For which plot is the causal relationship between x and y? Oh, I had not confounded by group membership. So what you want to do is think, okay. First off, not confounded. That means this overall slope, like this, you're going to get this overall, it's, I guess, do you see how in this you have this, oh, you have a, the a, you think there's a positive relation between x and y, between this, in this group, everybody, you know, x looks like x, causes y, if we're talking about causation, x causes y. But then, just because of the placements, they have different averages, the regression is going to give you a negative overall correlation. And that's confounding. So that one is confounded. How about this one? Again, it's going to give you this negative correlation when neither group has a negative correlation. So when you, you're thinking about causation, you're thinking about, hmm, this is bogus, because it says that overall it would say that X, as X goes, gets bigger, Y gets smaller. There's a negative correlation, but there isn't for any, any group. So, that has, so it's this one. There's no confounding here because the overall would just be the same as the groups. The overall would say, uh, do you understand why there's no confounding here? Okay. And um, that's uh, just a conceptual question. Now we're getting to the multiple regression here. And uh, this is probably the harder part, but it's more recent. So I, I like to use real survey data. You'll be seeing some of your real survey data on the exam. And it says, okay, on survey one, 238, don't mix it up with stat 200. Some people think N is 200. No, 238, I'll bold it. You'll see it there. Reported their ACT scores. So these are the variables, how many hours they studied, and their GPA. Okay. And again, we're assuming, we're, we're going to do inference. So we're assuming these were chosen randomly. And so in our, from larger population, and this is our sample regression, we see equation, we see that there is some correlation. But the null is, the null is always that in the whole population, these two slopes are zero. Okay, and that's, that's the idea. So, so 
we fit this equation. Now it has two x's. So it's no longer a line. It's a plane. And it's made, the, the, the it's, it's gotten to minimize the sum of squared errors. Well, what, what are the errors? Errors in the y variables, how far we're predicting y. So it's errors in our y. This is a pretty good problem. OK, so you have to remember how to do this. All right, to interpret these. So students A and B study the same number of hours per week, but differ by six points in their ACT. So the regression predicts they differ by how many? Well, you have to look at the, the coefficient in front of the study hours, right? In front of the ACT, right? We're looking at this, this equation here. And we're saying, for each point on the ACT, for people who study the same hours, for each point, your GP on the average goes up by 0 0.03. So if there's six point difference, it's going to go up by six times that. And that's where that came from. Um, what if I asked you, um, students A and B study the same number. Let's say uh, student A studies 10 more hours. Let's make this one different than B than student B. And also, um, and also has a six point higher ACT than B. All right, so now you'd have this for the ACT, but you'd also have to add in what? For each hour, more than he studies, you have to look up here. There is, for each hour, he raises it by that amount. So you'd have to say 0 0.04, 10 times that, plus 6 times 0 0.03. OK, and you'd get what? 0 0.4 plus 0, 0.18. So it would be 0 0.58. OK, so you just have to add them together. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm really sorry. I'm, you know, it's like you're speaking so softly. Could you say it again? Yeah, um, for 35, so like since you're looking at for 35. slopes, um, is like yeah. it's not a line because you're looking at two slopes. So if there was more than two, would it not okay. be a plane anymore? Yes, good question. She said, okay, so now uh, with one slope, it's a line. With two slopes, it's a plane. What would it look like if there were three slopes? Well, if there were three slopes, we wouldn't be able to visualize it because we can only s visualize four dim three dimensions. So we'd be in four dimensions. The math is exactly the same. <laughs> But you're just in um, dimensions that our minds can't picture. But we do everything the same. OK? So um, now, let's see. So now, we're, where were we? OK, so now the above, OK, plan about. All right, we're right here. And now, here's the correlation matrix. And it always has that diagonal of 1. And it's symmetric because the correlation of x 1 and x2 is the same as x2 and x1. So I think that's pretty explanatory. Pretty. I don't think nobody has questions with that, probably, right? OK, the slope for ACT in the multiple regression is 0 0.03. The slope in the simple regression, this is, a, this is the so slope in the simple regression, because they're all correlated with each other, it also includes the part that's correlated with the other x variable. And when you put them in the multiple regression, they get partialed out. If they're all positive co cor correlated, that means they get smaller in the multiple. They always change if they're correlated at all. Um, the multiple correlation, this is a really important one. The multiple correlation is 0 0.31. How is that calculated? Remember. The only way that 
correlation is defined is on two sets of numbers. And we have three sets of numbers here. We have the x variables, the y variables, x1, x2, and y. So you can't think of it the same way. You have to, so what are we doing? We're making a prediction from our regression model, and we're correlating that, the predicted y's, with the actual. Then we have two sets of numbers. That's the only way you, so it's a measure of how good our predictions are, how close they are to the actual y values. So that's what it is. Now, so I said, okay, so we're doing this overall regression to see, you know, which is always all the, ba all the slopes are zero. And both a chi-square and an f, you can do both of those for multiple regression. You cannot do a t or an f as long as you have multiple slopes, multiple groups. How can you T and Fs are for things that where you can get assigned number. You can get either bigger than or less than, like one difference. If you have two slopes, one could be positive, one could be negative, and combining them, there's no good way to combine them. You, you want to combine the magnitude of them, and so we have to square them and sum their differences. And that's the sum of squares comes in when you have more than one difference. So as soon as we're in multiple regression, we're doing sums of squares. The only time we can do the chi, you see that we can always do the chi squared and the f for simple regression, but it, we can't take the t and the f are only for simple. They can't do multiple. Okay, so we're doing an overall test, and now we get these two statistics, and they look really different, even though their p-values are usually not that different. That's the bigger one is always the chi-squared, because remember, its mean is going to be its degrees of freedom, so it's got to be, this mean's always 1, and the degrees of freedom are always, yeah, it's, it, it's if I gave you two ones, you'll, you'd be able to see this one's bigger. That uh, If I gave you one that was bigger, it has to be the chi-squared. Okay. Now look at the chi-square table. What's the critical value? The key is, the what are the degrees of freedom for chi-squared? It's just p minus 1. So you just look. It's not complicated. There's no n or anything involved. You just go to 2 degrees of freedom, and here's your critical values. And our chi-squared is even bigger than that one. So that means we're less. We're further out. See, our car, the critical value is about here, and we got... 20 something. So our p, what is it? We got, yeah, 25.3. So think about it this way. This at 13, at, I guess it would be right here, 13.82. That area, all this area is only what? 0.1%. Now our chi squared is out here at um, 20. 5.2, right? Isn't that what I said before? Our chi-squared is way out here. So our chi-squared is equal to, uh, we're comparing these two, 25.3. So do you see how our p-value is almost zero? It's not exactly zero, but it's almost zero. Does that make sense? If you don't understand I really want you to understand p-values, they come up all the time, and it's just so weird. This is saying if the null was true, if the null is true and those slopes were zero, just by the luck of the draw, we're not going to get this. All right, so it's less than 0.1%. It's very close to zero. And always, the p-value is bigger with the f and the t. They have fatter tails. You need more evidence to reject the null. We have more uncertainty because we're estimating those standard deviations by using those, um, and that's where the degrees of freedom for the n come in and all that stuff. So we always have fatter tails and bigger p-values. But as n gets, you know, pretty soon they get, you can, they're hardly distinguishable. Now, if you decide to reject the null, it means not that both of them are significant necessarily. They could be either one, the other, or both. Okay, with the overall. Now, then that's where you do the Z or T test, and you do them always the usual way, except the degrees of freedom are now based on every, it's, it's well, the degrees of freedom are equal to N minus P all the time. So if you just have one slope, it's N minus 1. Now we have 
more slope, so it's n minus 2 or n minus 3. Okay, so that's why it's that, because we had three slopes, three parameters, and 238 people, so that's why it's that. All right, um, so if you find something significant at 1%, right here it says, we found something significant at 1%. What does that mean? How do you translate that into the confidence interval? Well, if it's a two-sided test, which it, um, I would have to say, because they're doing, um, yeah, two-sided. For two-sided, it means that the 1% together is on either side. It went this way or that way, so 99% in the middle. So they, that's how they match up. Confidence intervals are alri always symmetrical, so they can only match, it, so it's easier to match them up with the um, two-sided tests. So qu they're equivalent to the two-sided tests with that same confidence interval and the same, um, you know, 99% of the time you're inside here and 1% of the time you're outside just by the luck of the draw. Your sample is. Does that make sense? So then... Another variable is added to the model that's negatively correlated. I don't care if it's negatively or positively. It gives me a better prediction. If it's correlated, I know more information, I get a better prediction. So R squared goes up. Okay? The only time it stays the same is if you just put some variable in that doesn't tell you anything. It can never go down. Because if there's no correlation, if like it has nothing to do with it, with anything you're doing, it's not going to make your predictions worse, it's going to make your uh, test statistic worse, but not your R squared. So that's why we use, with different numbers of parameters, we don't use R squared to compare models. We use the p-values instead. All right, and if you have a third variable that's correlated, we add it to the model. Wait a minute, you have to read it carefully. Let's say a third variable that's correlated with GPA that has predictive value. So we want it in the model. It's correlated. It's going to tell us something about why. And um, the slopes for the study hours and the ACT don't change. What happened? You know, the two m variables that are already in the model, they don't change. That must mean that that third variable is adding information that's not contained at all in X1 and X2. So they're not correlated. Otherwise, their slopes would change. So whatever information that third variable is bringing to be, to, to be correlated with Y is not contained in X1 and not contained in X2. So those slopes will stay exactly the same. All right. Now this, you do need to know how to do this. Um, okay. Let's think about this. Because this is... Um, there's also, this reminds me of a problem that, let me see if I, so this is going back and from scratch, figuring out um, the sum of squares, we know that the sum of squares total, this is what analysis of variance is based on, is equal, is breaks down this total variability into two pieces, the sum of squares model, that's called between here, and the sum of squares error. And we're going to do, uh, this is computing everything from scratch with the raw data. And I want to, I realized I didn't put an example on here like we did in, um, on page, I think it was 127, that I should probably include here, because we did the same exact thing from scratch with, uh, on page 128. So why don't we do an example of both of those now? So I printed one out from the homework, and I'm just trying to look for it. Here it is. Okay, so this the reason why I'm, I want to go over it is because it will give you a good feel for remembering what it's all about, what this is all about. So here's the one in your notes this one. I think you remember how to do that. Maybe we should do that one first. I can just go over it. You did this type of problem a lot. What we said was, okay, what are we doing here? The sum of squares total is um, you take all your, these y variables, 
the to all of them. Boy, there's a lot of them here. So this would be a long problem because you have, what, one, two, three, four, five, fifteen of them. So you'd say for all fifteen of these, you'd have to do um, y sub i, that's just these fifteen numbers, each one of those, you'd subtract off the average. Oh, I gave it to you. No wonder. That's a lot of work. And that's the total. So now it's easier to just do these group means. Now, what is, um, let me write it down here. So what is sum of squ squares it, for your model or for B? Is your sum of squares for the model or for B, it's the same, is equal to what? It's how much better your model does. So it's the sum for all those 15 numbers here for of, of what? Of not... Uh, it's of your predicted <coughs> minus the overall average. That's what we're doing here. And the sum of squares for the error is the observed minus the predicted. So that's why sub i. So that's the idea. Okay? So when we did it here, why it's easy is because for these five numbers, what we're predicting is its group mean. So for all of these numbers, you know, for each number in here, I'd start with one. What would I do? I'd say, um, one, I wouldn't put a one in here, I say it's predicted as three. So you say three minus the overall average, which is given to you, no one, oh, I made it a lot easier. Three minus eight, that squared. And for this, it's also predicted as three. So it's gonna be three minus eight squared. For this one, all of these have the same prediction. This is, they're in this, this group, that's their y hat. So that's why this one's easy. So you'd say five times that, plus five times. Do I need to go on with that? You've done this a lot. Do you understand how to do this? Do you want me to keep going or not? Raise your hand if you want me to keep going. So we'll do this. This is how you'd get that. If there were six in the group, each group, we'd say, um, here's the, this is, you know, y bar, and this right here is the group, the predicted. And you're doing the same thing. Here's the predicted here, and that's y bar. Here's the predicted here, and that's y bar. And then here is just how many are in each group. Do you see? So that's why it's pretty easy. And for this one, it was, uh, was a lot of work. What are we doing here? For here, the sum of squares within, we're saying, okay, the sum of squares within, first of all, it's so much easier to just do this. You know that they have to add up to what? They have to together add up to, see so a SST, <coughs> which is 280, is equal to SS, um, you've already got this one with 250, SSB, which is equal to 250, plus SSE. So you know it has to be 30. But you can go ahead and, um, so you could do it either way. And how did it? What is it? Remember what it is. For each one, it's your errors. How bad you're predicted. Observe minus your predicted. We've said that over and over again. So it's just the observed minus the predicted. So for each one of these 15 numbers, all the way through for all these numbers, you're just going to subtract off its predicted. So for the first five, you're going to subtract off three. For the next, you'll subtract off eight, etc. sum and square them. It's a lot of work. I just figured everybody would do this and then just subtract. Know that this plus this has to equal that. Okay, so let's say you saw uh, an example like this now. What would you do? How would you do the same problem? Well, um, and you had your homework on it too. I think it's in homework 12. It's the same thing, so you can look at it. Um, so what are we doing here? So it's exactly the same model. You have what? Um, sum of squares total is equal to sum of squares model plus sum of squares error. All right? And your total is what? It's the sum from, now you only have three points here. So you're saying a random sample of these three points, these, yielded the sample regression equation of this. 
Okay? So you took three points from a larger population. In the population, you think it's, there's no uh, slope. But here you do get a slope. But it's only three points. So let's see. Let's try it. So let's figure this out. So we have, all right, so this is just for three points, y sub i, you know, your observed minus. This is just the deviations. You've done this in stat 100. Each one of these is a deviation from its mean. That's all sum of squares total is. It's the first step towards a standard deviation. You just take subtracting off the average for all the points, but squaring them first and then summing them. All right? Now, this is the same thing. This is just the model makes a prediction. So instead of, so we want to see if our model's any better. So we're using the prediction minus the overall and squaring them. And here's our errors, our observed minus our model squared. Okay, so what do you have to do? You have to get, um, let's just list them. So what do we want? We want the actual points. Well, they're there. So what are they? They're the y's. We're talking about the y's. So we have 7, our actual, there's just three points, 7, 1, and 25. Okay? Then we have to get the predicted and the y bar. So y bar is what? Just the average of 7 plus 1 plus 25 divided by 3. And that is 11. So now we've got that. And the last thing we need to get is the predicted. So let's just get that. So what's the predicted? Do you know how to get the predicted? That's here. It tells you a recipe for getting it. That's what this is. So what we're doing is for x equals 1, we got this y right? 7. But what do we predict? Well, we go to this regression line, and it predicts what? You put a 1 in there, and it says 3 minus 1, so that's 2. That's one of our predicted. 2. And what's another predicted? Let's get another one. Our next one is for 3. So we go to 3. We got 1 right here, but our predicted is going to be way up here, right? So let's do it. So you get what? 8. So that's 8. And the next one is what? The next one is we 8. We go x is 8. And we want that predicted. Our actual is that. Our actual is 25. But we predict what? Put a 25 and put up 8 in there. And what do we get? 24 minus 1 is 23. So the Maybe if I wrote it down this way, it would be better. So these are our actuals. That's 7, excuse me, 7, 1, and 25. And that's y bar. That's all we need for the whole thing, OK? So y bar is 11. Now we can just put everything in here, all right? So whichever one you want to compute, I think the easiest way, I don't want to do it this way. I think the easiest way is just uh, I would give you one of these. Maybe. So which one do you want to compute? Let's, we could compute them all. Let's do, let's say we wanted to compute sum of squares total. So sum of squares totals, what would we do? We take the observed, that's 7 minus 11 squared plus 1 minus 11 squared plus 25 minus 11 squared. We do that, all right? And let's say we wanted to do the model. Then we'd say our predicted. So our predicted is what? 2 minus 11 squared plus 8 minus 11 squared plus what's the last one? 23 minus 11 squared. And if we wanted to do the error, we'd just say, OK, it's 7, 1, and 25 again. But now we're subtracting off our predicted instead. So it's 1 minus 8 squared. Where'd that 25 come from? Oh, that's, and 25 minus 23 squared. It says, it's this part right here. These little things, these. And you just add them all up and square them. Do you want me to do that, or is that good enough? Want me to finish it up so you can check? I could. OK, so we'd get what here? 14, 4 squared is 16, right? Plus 100 plus 14 squared. Oh, is 196. So we'd sum all those up, and we'd get, I did it here somewhere, and we'd get 234. 
So if you want to check, you can make sure. And here you'd have 81 plus 9 plus um, 11. What's this one? 11, 14 squared. What's that? 12, 144, <coughs> excuse me, 144. So this would be equal to, that's our sum of square model. I got this mixed up. Sorry, I'm just trying to do it in my head here. I'll tell you what the answers are because I have them written down but not worked out. So I did this wrong, right? 296 plus 16 is 312. This one's 312. This is 234, and this is 78, and they add up. I don't want you to spend a lot of time on this. This is going to be like one point, okay, because you're not going to show all this work. I mean, you might not even want it. It's a lot of work for one point. Why am I doing this at all? Because I, I think it really helps you understand if you don't get too hung up in it, and you could just do whichever one you want. It's one or two points out of the whole test because it's a lot of work, a lot of steps, and don't get freaked out if you don't want to do it. But I just want you, I want you to study it. It's more, if I tell you it's going to be on there, you'll understand it. Do you understand? See what I'm saying? So don't worry about it too much. So let's move on. And it gives me a headache to do these things. I used to have to, I mean, most of, so we had to, used to have to do so many of these in past statistics classes. And I just don't want to bog your head down with them. But I want you to understand the process, what it means. Is that okay? Sounds good to everybody. Let's move on. All right. Now, where are we? So our next process, so we did all this. And now, let's see what we're doing. We are going to get through this. Yep. Okay. So, the table displays the responses, okay, of 182 stat. 200 students to the question, how many children would you like to have? You were asked that on your survey. I just looked at the data. The students also identified their ethnicity, and I want to see if um, there's differences among the groups um, between, you know, imagining that they were chosen from a wider population. So here's the uh, averages, and here's the standard deviations for these three groups. In this class, I guess in one class, sometimes I have to mix I really hate that I can't identify, you don't feel left out if your ethnicity isn't on here. It's just I don't want you to be, if there's a small enough, I don't want you to be identifiable. Like we don't have very many, uh, STAT 200 is mostly white and Asian. So if I put down black and Hispanic like I do for STAT 100 or all other ethnicities, um, you're identifiable because there's only, there are not that many people and I don't want to, I want to protect your privacy. So that's why I do it this way. Okay, so now how many degrees of freedom for the model? I think you know all this. Um, how would we get? Okay, so now I'm asking you to do this through filling out this table. So why don't we do a blank one so you can see where we start. This is important. So let's, let me get a blank exam so you can see what it looks like. So you can think about how to start this at least. Um, Let's get rid of this. It's too confusing. All right, so we're on page seven, because you'll definitely see something like this, and I want to make sure everybody knows how to do this. So, all right. We're not doing it from scratch. Look how many points there are. So what are we going to be doing here? I'm asking you to use this table to figure these out, right, to, to just fill in this table or parts of it. And I gave you a lot of information, so it's really not very hard. All right, first of all, what do I ask? How many degrees of freedom? So do you know how the degrees, the degrees of freedom were groups here? You know this is G minus 1. You know there's three groups. So there's right here, there's G is equal to 3. So that's going to be 2, all right? And they have to add up. So <coughs> this has to be 179, but you know that it's N minus G. And N is 182 minus 3. So it works. They add up. So that's, you need to know. And then um, this is super easy because you know they have to add here. So you just subtract that from that. So that one is really easy too, but I didn't even ask you for that one. What's the next one? 
So I asked two degrees of freedom for the model. The F stat. For t now, how are you going to get the F stat? You just have to know. And look, you could even, if you, there's a lot of clues in here. If you didn't know two, you could just say, if you knew that SSB divided by this equals that, you could figure it out. There's just a lot of clues in here if you understand the structure of the um, table. So you don't, you don't have to memorize stuff. So this is just going to be MSB 20.43 divided by 1.55. That's how you get that. And it's equal to 13.18. So that's where that comes from. And now, how do you get the standard deviation plus of the errors? J that's just the square root of that. Wait a minute, did I even ask you for it? I don't know if I did. R squared. Okay, now how do you get this? This is when you, how are you going to get that? I didn't give you R. Do you know that R squared is just going to be your SS model over SST? Remember, the model is R squared times SST. The error, the sum of squares error is 1 minus R squared times SST, and together they add up to SST. That's all we're doing here. All right, so it's just 40.86 over 40.86. And when I did that, I got 0 0.18. No, no, no. 0 0.128. Okay? Any questions on that? So I think you're going to like these tables because if you know, there's a lot of different ways you can, um, if you forget one thing, you can look back, and it's helpful because it will help you, if you forget in another place what the degrees of freedom are, you can just look back here. Now, um, what do you conclude? What do you conclude? This F stat right here is, so we have R squared is always SSP b over SST, and make sure we found it here. Okay. That looks like a really small R squared, but our F is big, and you don't even really have to look at the chart. It's When the null is true, it's about 1. You can look, but it's going to be a very small... You're going to reject the null. And, um, and if you reject the null, what's the conclusion? here that at least one of the groups averages significantly different. You're going to have an F table, so you can look on it if you, as well, you know, if you to check things. But you should know when you see an F that big. No way is it going to be, uh, it's, you're always going to reject the null when it's that big. Okay, now compute the T statistic to test whether the difference between other and Asian is significant. All right, so how are we going to do this? Here are the, we have the data here. And other in Asian, so we're just going to, okay, first we have to look at the SE difference. So this is something you have to remember. So the SE difference between the two groups is what? This is pretty easy. The S, and I give you this big hint here to use this. So it's just equal to, it's going to be equal to the standard deviation. It's the same thing you got there the standard deviation plus of the errors, which is the estimate of the errors for, you look here and you see they're not that different, and we're going to estimate all of these with the, this one. We're going to use, because the assumption is that in the population they have the same standard deviations. So it's that times the square root of 1 over the sample size of each. That so these, so you're just looking at the sample sizes here and seeing which one, what, what differences. We want other and Asian. So you just say, oh, the sample sizes have to be these two. Just look, make sure that those are in the denominator. Yes, that's all you're looking at there. It's confusing. You might just, you know, look at those or something else. Make sure it's just the ends there. And that's the idea. And the t-statistics is what's in the numerator now. That's in the denominator. But in the numerator, the t-statistic is just t. And this is not even something you have to memorize. It's just going to be the observed difference. 
between the two groups minus the expected under the null, which is always zero, over the standard error plus for the difference. So all you want in the numerator is the difference between the two averages. And so which one is it? Um, it's Asian and other, so it's going to be the difference between those two numbers. And it's two-sided, so it doesn't matter which way you subtract. I just, I'm not going to give you a, a positive and a negative. So uh, it's just 0.7. So um, it's this one. These two are the same. Oh, no, I, I didn't see that. I'm so sorry. Boy, it's this one. I didn't even see that part. Don't multiply it by anything. It's that one. Any questions? You have to read these carefully. The print's so small. Boy, this is a long test, isn't it? And it's about the same length as yours. Maybe yours is even... Um, the last question, you'll definitely have something like this. Now you have to know this What? All right. The p-value, without any correction, was this. But remember, we have to correct it if because uh, we didn't state the hypothesis ahead of time. And we looked at all the groups. So I said, okay, the Bonferroni would correct it by what? It's going to, you're going to multiply by what? You multiply, you're going to make the p-value bigger by g times g minus 1 over 2. So in this case, we have 3 times 2 over 2, so it's equal to 3. It's going to be this one. And that's the whole exam. And uh, your exam, of course, isn't going to be, you know, exactly like this. Of course, th oh, there's a re-randomization problem, so we should do make sure you understand how to do that. So let's quickly look at that on the study guide. What? It's all multiple choice, but there is definitely a re-randomization problem. So well, you know that from the study guide. Do you need any help with that? Just make sure you know how to do the re-randomizations. Uh, I'll see if I can find one on the study guide. But does anybody want to me to go over one of those? Or you do. All right, I've got to just find it here. Do the study guide, too. There's so, some good problems on there, for sure. Here's a re-randomization. Okay, so another way to find a p-value always is so much easier is by re-scrambling up randomly assigning the y-values if w you're doing a regression or if you were, let's see what this one is about. Okay, so this is instead of, so there's a multiple regression. All right, and we already saw it was significant and we got an r equal to R squared equal to 0 0.16, so R must be equal to 0.4, some 0.4. And another way to, to do these tests is to say, okay, if, if it was truly random to test the strict null, we could assign any of the Y values to uh, just randomly assign the actual values to the, to, in keeping the, uh, the uh, x1, okay, let's just do an example. So let's say in this example, <coughs> every single person has what? Next three variables as associated with them. This is education for the husband or every point. Education for the husband, education for the wife, and um, income, all right? So we want to know, uh, the null says that husband and wife's education means nothing in terms of predicting income. If that were true, you could randomly take the hundred and however many points are in your data set, you could, every, you know, however, however many husband-wife pairs are in your data set, and uh, assign them one of the random, randomly assign them an income. It has nothing to do with how, with their education. And so then each time you do that, you compute an R between what their actual income is and what the model, with the ran what, what the correlation based on those randomly assigned ones was. 
and see how likely it is that we get a correlation as strong as our sample. And, the, what the, and so you have a distribution of empirical, huge in distribution of empirical R's produced through simulations. We, and we want to see how our one sample that we, the null says was produced by randomization, but it really, that's what the null says, that there's nothing there. And we want to see where it would fit in when you really do scramble them all up. We're simulating, um, instead of sampling from a large population, we're simulating breaking the connection between the Y and the Xs, and then, so that there's no connection anymore, and then just randomly assign them. Every time we do that, we get an R value. You're not always going to get an R of zero, even though there really is no correlation. You're going to get a distribution of Rs due to, that are different from zero due to random chance. And that distribution Look how many times we did it. We did 50,000 of them. So we got a whole lot that had like point, you know, 0 0.1, really small, small. You can't get negative here because they're absolute value of R. So we got a whole bunch of them. The highest it could ever go is 1, right, which would be if every, if we just somehow got them exactly correlated just by the luck of the draw, which is so could happen. But look how rare it is to get 0.4. So what we're saying is, it's so rare that this one that we're s the null says came from something like this. Does it look like it came from it? No, we got a p-value of zero. That's the idea of what the what it means. It enacts the null hypothesis. It's an enactment. It's a computer simulation of the null hypothesis. Very cool, and um, so you can do that. And uh, if you were going to be doing it with the groups, the picture would be, I mean, just out of curiosity, you might be interested, you have a bunch of groups. So you say, okay, like let's say whatever we're assigning, some rate uh, scores, exam scores, let's say they were. And we think you might have a group, one, two, three, four, maybe freshmen, sophomores, uh, juniors, and seniors. And we're saying, okay, we're putting them all here together, and we're just randomly, however many freshmen we have in the class, we're going to randomly put them here, here, here. And of course, we have some mean here, an overall mean, and why would the, you'd expect the means all to be the same and equal to the overall mean, right? That's what you'd expect, which would be z a correlation of zero, an R of zero, right? But you're not going to get exactly that. So... When you do that, what do you do? You, teach, you say, just by the random assignment, we're not going to get exactly the same averages for each of them. So how different are they? So we compute um, an F statistic, or an R, which would tell us how basically the same thing. The null says that R is equal to zero, that knowing which group is in gives you no information about this because it's just random assignment, right? So then we take our particular class stuff that we're, we really do have differences here, and we see how likely it would come from that distribution. So you're enacting a randomized experiment or something like that, randomly assigned category. So it's a beautiful enactment of very easy to understand, much easier to, to understand than all these distributions. And um, so it's very nice that they match up. It's a sanity check. It says, hey, what we're doing actually corresponds to some simple experiment that we could show to a fifth grader. So I think it's really cool. So you'll see some something. So just know that's, that's all that's happening there. Okay? And good luck tomorrow. And I have office hours today from 3.30 to 3.30.